afternoon. I'm Deanna Van Hirsch with programs at the Kansas Health Foundation. As we've discussed this morning, Kansas is changing. At the heart of this change is a significant demographic shift throughout the state. Here today to discuss issues of race and ethnicity, disparities and opportunity is Maria Inahosa. Maria is an award-winning news anchor and reporter who covers America's untold stories and highlights today's critical issues. In 2010, Hinojosa created the Futuro Media Group, an independent nonprofit producing multimedia journalism that gives a critical voice to the diversity of the American experience. As anchor and executive producer of the Peabody award-winning show Latino USA, which is distributed by NPR, and anchor and executive producer of the PBS show America by the Numbers with Maria Hinojosa, she has informed millions about the changing cultural and political landscape. In 2016, Hinojosa became host of In the Thick, Futuro Media's new political podcast and Humanizing America, the company's digital video series that deconstructs stereotypes. Hinojosa's nearly 30-year history as an award-winning journalist includes reporting for PBS, CBS, WNBC, CNN, NPR, Frontline, and CBS Radio, and anchoring the Emmy award-winning talk show Maria Hinojosa One-on-One. Inahosa is also a contributor to the long-running award-winning news program CBS Sunday Morning and is a frequent guest on MSNBC. Please help me welcome Maria Inahosa. All right, so this is a really big podium. It's a problem of being a chaparra. Chaparra is a shorty in Mexican Spanish. So for those of you who are Mexican, you're like, what? Did she just call herself a chaparra? Yeah. Um, so I think I'll kind of stand around like, oh, actually, wait, what? I don't even need this. Oh, I'm free. Oh. Great. Um, hey, what's up, Wichita? I know that they are going to, I'm just, I'm just putting this out there because I did just mil misspell Wichita in the book that I just signed. So please don't hold me accountable. I'm very sorry. I think it is my first time in Wichita. I'm almost 100% sure it is. So thank you so much for having me. Um, not my first time in Kansas, though. Not my first time in Kansas. Um, but thank you for the thunderstorm this morning. I was like, what? Oh, thunder? <gasps> you know, which actually is interesting, because um, I'm joking about it, but I love to find little things in life that you're just like, wow. I haven't, you know, we don't hear thunder a lot in New York City. So um, I actually was kind of grateful. I was like, that's the coolest thing. Uh, so, but actually, well, first, thank you so much um, to the Kansas uh, Health Foundation for having me here. Um, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be invited by you and to have a chance to connect with you. And when I saw this space, I was kind of imagining a different scenario. So when I saw this space, I actually said, I want to, if it's OK with you, I'll switch things up a little bit. And I, I do have a, a speech, but I'd kind of like to make this a little bit more interactive. So while I'm giving my stories and telling my, if there's something that you're just like a burning question or something that I said, just raise your hand. And I'll say, OK, let's talk about that for a minute. And then I'll come back to the speech. Because I'm not going to be here a long time. It took me two airplanes to get here yesterday, both of which were on time. <laughs> really hoping I get <clears throat> the same um, when I leave today. So I'm not going to have a lot of time. So I appreciate the, we had a really, really fabulous um, lunch. And I, I'm also from the Midwest. I was born in Mexico City, raised in Chicago. I consider Kansas sort of part of the larger kind of. <laughs> but in the sense that how we treat each other, the way we talk, you know, that earnest thing that we have is actually really important. So thank you so much for having me and for inviting me. It's really, really my honor. Um, and all of that is to say I got eight hours of sleep last night. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, and I'll talk a little bit about self-care and how I take care of myself. And one of the things that I talk about, well, actually, I don't talk about I think I'll talk about it more, is actually sleep, the importance of sleep. So to get eight hours, which is what I normally try to get, I actually think I got nine. So thank you so much. That really means a lot. But then, as I was um, thinking about how I wanted to open my speech, um, actually, you know, I, I'm very loved. I have, my husband and I have been married for, we've been together for 28 years, married for 27 years. I have a son who's 22, a daughter who's 20. They're really doing great. And um, 
And so I'm very loved. I have a great staff. I have good friends. But there's something that I've been feeling really deep in my core. And I'm like, what is it? And it's like, I'm really sad. I'm <laughs> really sad. It wouldn't take much to make me cry. Like, and then I'm like, and I also feel really lonely. And I'm like, but why do I feel lonely? Like when I'm loved and I have so much, why am I feeling lonely? And then as I was writing this, I was like, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm waking up to images of children being held by our, by our government. And yes, you can snap. If anybody was snapping or was that the mistake, you can snap. You know, like, have you, you guys have heard of this, right? So if you like anything that I'm saying, you can just do this. It sounds really loud because I've got a mic. But just do that. Some people might look at you like, what are you doing? You have a tick? No. <laughs> it's a way in which you can kind of say, like, I'm feeling you. I'm feeling you, even though I'm not doing spoken word, even though I am doing spoken word. <clears throat> I play with words, as you can tell. And, there is, and as I was thinking about this, there were actually two words that came into my mind as I was feeling lonely and sad about children in our country being who are not criminals. One of them was 56 weeks old. No, yeah. Eh. And that our government is separating, like on purpose, not by accident, not by mistake, actually on purpose. So the two words that I thought of were la hielera, and I know you guys are like, what did she just say? And la perrera. And I actually want you to know these words. These are words that those of us who are immigrants or who have reported in this case as a reporter, a journalist, um, these are words that we know. And if you ever have a conversation with one of your immigrant um, Kansan, Wichitanian brothers and sisters, you can ask them about this because they are your brothers and sisters. They are living here. They're like you, experts on the weather and the storms and the this and the that. They're, they're Kansans just like you, but they've probably lived through something that you don't know, which is this word, la yelera. La yelera is the place where immigrants who are caught coming without papers, right? which by the way, well, it's always been a misdemeanor. It's now becoming a federal crime for which you are being put into prison, not immigration detention camp but a prison, but it really was always a misdemeanor. Um, when you are caught by Border Patrol or by ICE, they put you into La Yelera, which in Spanish means the ice box or the refrigerator. And I know you're like, wait, what? What are immigrants being put into refrigerators? No, they're not being put into refrigerators, but they're being put into rooms. And these are people who have come with nothing except for the cold t-shirt because they were running or because it was hot. And then they are put into a room that is kept at almost, I don't know, 50 degrees? What's enough to make a person feel really uncomfortable? You know, like there's no sign of torture, no marks. Every immigrant who comes here and is caught is put into La Yelera in our United States of America. And by the way, it's been happening for years, years. So, you know, as I think about this, I'm like, well, why am I upset about this now? It's been happening for years. Of course, now it is actual policy, <clears throat> the separation. But this notion of children, mothers, women, men being put into ice boxes has been happening for years. Recently, a new term came up that I hadn't heard, but now because of the conversation around children, it's another term called la perrera. Who can tell me what is una perrera? ¿Qué es una perrera? Come on, those of you, ¿dónde estás Ernesto? ¿Dónde estás Ernesto? ¿Qué es una perrera? You said animal control. Actually, una perrera is a doghouse which is actually made out of fence and wire and gate. This is where children are being put into. La Perrera, they are being held 
in cages. As we speak today at 1.20 Central Time in Wichita, there are children who are being held in cages, separated by policies from our government. People don't like it when I say it, but you know, these policies did not start a year and a half ago. Right? A lot of this, most of it, <clears throat> all of it, except for the actual um, affirmative separation of parents and children was happening under the Obama administration, um, basically on steroids after it began in the Bush administration, before it was signed into law by Bill Clinton. So it's complicated. There's no great party here. It's not like one party or the other is like, oh, well, we got this. No, no it's not. That actually makes it really complicated for all of us. But I just want to make it clear that in this, in, in these conversations, <clears throat> I have no party. People get very, really upset. You know, they're like, why do you criticize the, the Democratic Party? What's your party? I'm like, I have no party. I'm a journalist. I'm just trying to tell you things and been trying to tell you guys for a while, not you specifically, but in general. And so seriously, some days, Recently, I've woken up, I'm like, wow, you know, when you introduced me so beautifully and you said she's been at it for 30 years, I'm like, no, not really, really? <sighs> yes, I'm getting old, which is better than the alternative. But then I just think, like, wow, 30 years of an award-winning career trying to tell these stories. Okay. Why? <laughs> Why? Why? How did this happen, right? I mean, that's how I wake up. I'm like, pero papi, may you rest in peace. My father, who came as a Mexican immigrant uh, <laughs> from the small town of Tampico <clears throat> and was a professor and a researcher, a medical doctor at the University of Chicago, part of the large team that helped to create the cochlear implant. So health, health generally has been a part of my entire family, and yet when I meet people, because of course I'm meeting people and I'm talking to everybody, oftentimes about politics through love. But you know, one of the things that people will say now, <clears throat> um, when I say, you know, well, I'm Mexican, they'll say, well, you have to come the right way. Like, before I have said anything. I know, I'm like, what? Because uh, like this dialogue, I am you, you are me, so that's the way I travel in the world. Now, sometimes when I've been on the road for like the whole month of May, I'm not talking to everybody who's sitting next to me in the plane, but most of the time, I'm trying to talk to people. Because I can do that now, because I'm old enough now, and I could care less, right? <laughs> or I could care so much, lesbian, right? And I'm very, I'm very aware that I'm a journalist, and so that gives me a capacity to talk to people. Um, and sometimes I identify who I am, so it's very clear that they're talking to a journalist. And sometimes when I'm just Maria, I'm not identifying myself and I'm just having a conversation. And, um, and most recently, it was I was flying back from Pittsburgh to Chicago. And the guy who was sitting next to me was like 75 years old, um, wearing blue jeans and not like Jordache, but like worked in blue jeans. And um, that was a joke. You can laugh. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and so I, you know, I was like, I don't really want to talk to him. But he was so personable with me. And I was like, OK, I'm going to talk to him as the plane is landing. <laughs> so I was like, so you know, blah, 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 this and that, this and that. So you know, so how are you feeling? Eh, good. So, so personal question, who'd you vote for? <clears throat> I always say, can I ask you a personal question? Most of the time, they say yes, which I love. I'm kind of like, I would never say yes. But they're like, sure. So sir, who'd you vote for? For Trump. OK. So how are you feeling? Uh, you know, I'm, it's, okay, it's good, you know? I'm like, OK. Um, he was very, very sweet. And, um, and then I just said, well, you know, sir, I'm a, I'm a Mexican immigrant. My whole family's from Mexico. So I said, it, it feels a little weird to kind of be now the target of such hate. So, well, did you come in here the right way? <laughs> Yes, sir, I did. I came in with a green card. And then I got really close to him. You know how when you're in an airplane, you're sitting like this? So I switched my seat so I could look at him right in the eye. And I was just like, yeah. So when they talk about immigrants, it's me. 
It's me, it's my family, it's me, it's me. And what I love about that man was that he stayed there looking at me. He stayed there and he was just like, okay. I just took all my time to tell that story, I'm so sorry. But part of, <laughs> part of what I like to do is I like to be in the moment, right? And so, um, and so I wanted to tell you that story because that's what I do. And I guess I'll tell you this next story because it kind of leads into it. It was later in my speech, but. So as we were talking over lunch, somebody was saying, so what can we do? What can we do? And I was like, well, one of the things that you, first of all, you need to recognize that you all are incredibly powerful in terms of shaping the narrative of Kansas. You have to realize how much power you have. I need to hear the snaps when they're happening. Don't just show me. OK, thank you. And you don't have to snap, but if you're going to snap, make me hear it. Um, yeah, you guys got a ridiculous amount of power. So, you know, things like the National Cattlemen's Association, I had to read it because, you know, those are not words that come out of my mouth <laughs> easily <laughs> as a Manhattanite. The National Cattlemen's Association or the Farm Bureau. You know, I, I'm not hanging around with cattlemen or Farm Bureau people, but I want to know everything about what's happening here now, now that I've been here, now that I have friends here. Those two organizations could change everything in terms of this conversation. And I'm not trying to pick on them. It's just that they happen to have come up over lunch. But before I tell you a story about Omaha, I want you to know how incredibly powerful you are as you open your own eyes and process just in these two days of the conference. And what an amazing conference you guys have. All of these speakers are extraordinary. I'm friends with Eric. Um, I know Jeffrey, um, who wouldn't want to be friends with Steve Hartman. But I am a new contributor to CBS Sunday Morning, so hello. That deserves a round of applause. Thank you. No, 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 because seriously, I'm the first Latina correspondent to CBS Sunday Morning, and it's only 2018. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Um, so happy to be there. I love that show. Soon 60 Minutes, I swear to you, that's my dream. I'm gonna try to make it happen. Y'all can low key just be like, yo, 60 Minutes, don't you love Maria Hinojosa? You can do that. And I didn't say just to do that, so that was off the record. Uh, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, so, Omaha. Okay. So, I'm in Omaha because I love the Heartland. In fact, we are trying to launch a television series for PBS called. Heartland, I, I want to call it Heartlandia. My team wants to call it, call it Heartland. Um, so we are actively trying, and the idea is to report on the Heartland from a people of color perspective, i.e. myself and my team. To report, because when other journalists come into the Heartland, they see what they want to see. And I see something very different, which is the reason why I started laughing. I know you guys were laughing. You were like, why did she laugh? Because your Latino population is projected to grow by 287%? What? That's insane. Now, wrap your head around that. That's real. That number is real. So, real. That's what I'm talking about. Real. Look around you. And don't let people tell you what to think. I'm telling you actually not what to think. I'm telling you to open your eyes, right? So um, I get into the lift in Omaha. And, um, and as usual, <laughs> you know, I start a conversation. And the, the driver was like 55, white guy. And I did my thing. Hey, what's up? How you doing? Like, yeah, so dude, can I ask? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm condensing it. But I was like, can I ask you a personal question? Yes, yes. Well, so who'd you vote for? I voted for Trump. I said, OK, cool. So how are you feeling? It's like, well, I'm feeling OK. So this was, uh, when was this? I guess this was yeah, six months ago, uh, I think, seven, eight months ago. Um, how are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. I said, OK, so why'd you vote for him? So well, I voted for him because I really wanted that wall. I really wanted that wall. And I said, and why? And he said, well, because you know, I really want to keep out those gang bangers and those drug dealers. I'm, I just want to keep them out. And I said, yeah, interesting. I understand that. I said, sir, you live here in Omaha? Yes, I do. He said, you have a lot of Latinos here in Omaha, don't you? 
Yes, we do. A lot. I said, and do you see those gangbangers and those drug dealers in Omaha? In the Latino neighborhood in Omaha? And he said, no, no, actually, no, I don't. Oh, boy, you got me. I was like, well, I wasn't trying to get you, sir. I was just asking you the question. He was like, no, no, I don't, I don't actually. But you know what he said? But I really, I, OK, I really believe in the Muslim ban. And so I believe in the Muslim ban because I want to keep out those terrorists. And I said, sir, you live in Omaha, right? So you have a large Muslim population here, don't you? He said, yes, we do. And one of them is my neighbor. And I said, so have you seen the terrorists here? And he was like, oh, no, you got me again. And I was like, I'm not trying to get you, sir. Really, I'm not. I'm just asking you. And he said, oh, my God. You know, I think I need to, I think I need to stop listening to what they're telling me. Weirdly, he watches MSNBC and Fox. Ah. I know, it's just like, what? Um, so uh, yeah, he said, I think I need to just see. And I'm like, yeah. And then he said, you know, you're so smart, as I was getting out of the cab. You're so smart, lady. Where are you from? I said, I'm Mexican. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but I'm trying to tell you that because actually the data shows that the largest number, the, the counties that most voted most overwhelmingly for Donald Trump, the counties that voted most overwhelmingly for Donald Trump were counties that had the least amount of diversity. The least amount. So then it's a narrative, right? And the narrative is one that demographic change is coming and it's bad. And my narrative after just seeing that report right there is like demographic changes in Kansas and it's the thing that has saved you. And I'm just not making, and that's not because I'm like, whoa, people of color, yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at your numbers that you guys uncovered. We're not creating anything here. Right? OK, but I have to finish this thought because this is really sad. And I know I like to make you laugh. But I also hope to make you cry, or at least feel some of the pain of the moment. Because you know we have to feel both things. Right? Because I also woke up thinking about the fact that in great New York City, liberal bastion, you know, sanctuary this, sanctuary that. A Mexican dude delivered a pizza to an army depot in Brooklyn. And the guy who received the pizza from the Mexican dude called ICE. And that man was taken from his home and is now in detention. And he has two American citizen children because the military has been deputized to act as immigration or to intersect with immigration. So I'm thinking about that. And then I'm thinking about Kate Spade. Turns out that my executive director of my nonprofit organization in Harlem in New York City, please come visit anytime. I mean, anybody who you know who wants to work in the media, young people, we have a lot of interns, internships aside. But my executive director, who's African American from Harlem, was friends with Kate Spade. Their daughters are friends. They're both 13. And now my executive director's daughter has got to figure out how to talk to one of her best friends about the fact that her mother hung herself. My age. And part of why that happened as the reporting is now coming out, it's complicated. It's complicated. She had a complicated life with a, you know, so it's complicated. Every life is complicated. But one of the things that happened was that Kate Spade was bipolar. And Kate Spade apparently was a little bit ashamed of this and so didn't want to reveal and didn't want to go into treatment for fear that it would come out that this huge, successful woman um, you know, actually battles mental health, mental illness. I also woke up thinking about the fact that 114 people were taken from an Ohio gardening, gardening center 
yesterday. 114 people just picked up from a gardening center. Because you know, you know what happens in those gardening centers. Woo! Oof! Oof! What happens in those gardening centers? They're taking away so many jobs. Oh, my goodness. So much drugs and gangs going on in those gardening centers in Ohio. Yeah, they needed to come and take 114 people. Absolutely. And now they have a bunch of American citizen kids in Ohio who are like, what the hell just happened? What the hell just happened? And I woke up thinking about my student. Because you know, so I'm Mexican. I grew up in Mexico City. I was, um, had a green card till I was um, in my late 20s, then became a citizen. But I am a Mexican, Mexican immigrant, so and proudly identify. And so I have 16 jobs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of them is to be a professor. Um, so I'm a professor at DePaul University in Chicago, and I have several students. It's become not extraordinary that a student says, I can't come to class. I've got to go to immigration court with a family member. Uh, this one was pretty incredible, though. My honors student, uh, who was getting ready to go on a trip to Charlottesville as an honors student for an honors packet to the University of Virginia. Uh, her mother filed for her green card. Everything was going through, and there was one misfiled paper. And now they've told the mom she needs to leave the country immediately. And my student is like, my mom wants me to go with her because she hasn't been to Guatemala since she was 14. But my mom also wants me to stop studying, drop out of college, drop out of my fellows program, and become the legal guardian to my younger brother and sister. What am I going to do, Professor Hinojosa? What am I going to do? So, you know, how does it happen that we have to wake up like this? You know, and then, of course, there are moments when I really, really want to wake up from this nightmare, right? Would love to wake up from this nightmare. Because, you know, the thing is, is that sometimes people say, well, you know, you just want to tell these immigrant stories. You want to tell these stories about Latinos. No, these are American stories. These are American stories. In the case of Kansas, these are Kansas stories. These are not, these are your stories in your state, in your communities. Some of you in this room are actually making history. One of you in this room is actually a historical character who changed the dynamics of immigration in this country. Did you know that, that one of the people in this room is actually, there will be movies, Hollywood movies made about what she did. They're in this room, and I'm not going to point her out because that's not my job. She can identify herself if she wants. But she is in this room with you, and she is an American historical character. Like the people who marched on Selma, she put her life on the line to say this is what's happening in our world. She's right here in this room, right here with you, and if you're interested, Look for her. So what I'm saying is that this is, these are not foreign stories of you know, people far away. They're right here in your community. And so you know, as we're talking about um, you know, diversity, again, it's the kids who are playing with your kids. It's the kids who are playing with your grandkids. It's the kids who your kids might end up marrying. Because you know that whole thing about like Charlottesville, you will not replace us. You will not replace us. I'm like, oh, seriously? We don't want to replace you. Oftentimes, we want to hang out with you. We want to party with you. Want to marry you. Want to fall in love with you. And you're sitting here chanting, you will not replace us. You, what? Dialogue, right? Dialogue. At the same time, I understand the fear. I really deeply understand the fear. Guy Garcia um, is a great, great writer and journalist, said, you know, sometimes immigrants, I'm sorry, sometimes Americans, Americans from like this part of the world, country, say that they feel like the immigrants. Like, what's happened to my country? Everybody speaks Spanish. 
Everybody's growing a big afro. Transgender people are everywhere. Immigrants, you know, they're taking over. What happened to my country? I don't recognize my country. I feel scared. I don't understand this transgender thing. What do you mean he, she, them, gay, what? Got that? Okay. <laughs> watch Billions, OK? If you have Showtime, watch Billions. Have any of you watched Billions? Oh my god, seriously? What? Oh my god. So some of, one, some of you have Showtimes, watch Billions. So that, one, it's a very interesting take on the politics of the moment in terms of characters, but there is a transgender character. And then you know that if you are transgender, some transgender folks like to be referred to not as he or she, but as they or them. And there's a character <laughs> in that show who is they. And you're like, what? Watch it, and it will make it more fluid. Because we have to learn, regardless of what we think, as a generation of like, what, she, he, pronoun, it's part of the future. And we have to understand it and not be afraid of it. Not be afraid. Though seriously, at CNN, I covered the first transgender, um, uh, how do you, the, como is it? when you go as a representative to the Democratic Convention, you are a delegate, thank you. Uh, the first transgender delegate to the Democratic National Convention in the year 2000, a former Marine, Jane Fee. And I just remember thinking, oh, this thing about transgender, this is the year 2000. I was like, it's never going to, never going to ever be accepted in take national conversation. Boy, was I wrong. But at the, it's interesting that transgender folks can be elevated. If you're of color, it's much more challenging, to be true. But you know, throughout that same time, a people has become illegal, right? Which is why, if you follow me on my social media, you'll know that one of the things I always talk about is that there is no such thing as an illegal human being. Which is why you will never hear on any of the journalism that we produce at my nonprofit the term illegal immigrant. You'll hear it in a lot of places, and you may even use the term. And I know that now you're going to be like, let me think about that. It may actually come out of your mouth without even knowing it. Or they're just a bunch of illegal immigrants. Oh, there were some illegal. There were some illegals on the corner. No. So, one, I didn't learn that from a radical Latino studies professor. I learned it from somebody who could not be more different than me, Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust and won the Nobel Peace Prize. And when I met him, and I asked him that question, sir. I was a correspondent at CNN. I said, sir, they want me, I, they, they like me to use this term illegal immigrant, but I don't feel like it's grammatically correct, nor correct. He said, there is no such thing as an illegal human being. The first thing the, the, the Nazis did was they declared the Jews to be an illegal people. There's no such thing as an illegal human being. So then when people kind of are like stuck, they're like, well, what are, so what are they? What, what? So I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, <clears throat> but According to Harvard, 75% of adults in the United States of America have, have um, done the equivalent of a felony, just have never been found out. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have done the equivalent of a felony. But, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been given a really bad traffic ticket. You know. But I assume you have, because you're in Kansas and you drive fast. <laughs> Total assumption. Um, if so, if you have gotten a traffic ticket, you would from now on, if you follow the illegal immigrant logic, you would be an illegal driver. You're not an illegal driver. You're a driver who committed an illegal act. You're an immigrant who did a, something illegal. Although, you know, again, crossing the border, legal, legal. Huh. OK, I'll give you. You came illegally. You're living illegally in the United States. You are not an illegal person. It's, your, it's like if you're a dad and you forgot to pay the alimony, you're not an illegal dad. Right? If you forget to pay your taxes, you're not an illegal taxpayer. You're a taxpayer who committed a crime. Another term you will not hear on the journalism that we produce is minority. Because I'm not a minority, I've never looked at my kids and said, oh, kids, you're the members of a minority group. <laughs> This, do you like being a minority? I was like, no, I don't know. So I'm not going to use that term also because I understand, because I travel. 
And we know this because I do a television show called America by the Number and so America by the Numbers. And so by the data, I know that Anglo America will be a numerical minority in the future. You said it right here. It's going to be a minor majority minority state, which I'm like, what? OK, I understand what you're doing. But it's also very confusing, right? Because it's like, what? Eh. People of color will be the majority in this state. Oh my god, it's going to be OK, though. Just like it was for Dorothy. It's going to be OK. <laughs> it's going to be OK. <laughs> oh my god, I'm supposed to be done with my speech right now. But we started a little bit late, so I can take a few more minutes before I open it up to questions. And you guys didn't ask me one question in the entire speech. All right. Um, going through this, going, OK. So on the issue of diversity, well, actually, it's really good for our health. You know that being invisible is actually really bad for your health, bad for your mental health. It's actually bad for your mental health. I didn't know this. California Endowment has done some studying around this. But being invisible from the national narrative is actually really bad for your mental health. So the opposite of invisibility is visibility. And part of that is to say we are diverse and to recognize the diversity that we do have. But there's this other thing about diversity. And it's a term that I'm already we're just like, ah. Uh, because it's also smart market decisions. So I'm just going to talk for a minute about business. I'm going to get away from the how sad my heart is ripped open, my you know my veins are cut open, and I'm sad from what's happened because you know I'm Latina, very dramatic. <laughs> but now I'm just going to get to. <laughs> He's cracking up. He's like, I can't believe she just said that. Yeah, I just said. That. Okay, but now it's like the hard and cold facts. All right. So um, you already saw it just in terms of what's supporting the growth of Kansas is these demographics. Specifically Latinas, the women in this front row, you're Latinas? Yeah. Okay. So all, can you raise your hands? Okay. Those of you who are Latinas in this room, raise your hands. Okay. There's not a lot of them. But look at them. They are the most powerful consumers in the United States of America today. I know you're joking, but it's true. The most powerful consumers, what do I mean? We over-index over African American women and Anglo women in terms of deciding what we're going to buy in our homes, our households, what detergent we're going to use, what books we're going to read, what movies we're going to watch, what TV shows, what sponges we're going to use, what soap, what everything we decide because we run our households. We drive our households. In Spanish, se maneja la casa. We drive our households. I know, because you were like, what is she talking about? In Spanish, we say, maneja, uno maneja la casa. You drive your house. So that's what that is, because I don't want you to think I'm a little bit weird with that. OK. <laughs> so what we bring to the table, right? The, um, the, the Latino GDP in the United States of America, if it was a gross domestic product on its own, it would be the seventh largest in the world ahead of India. Hmm. Thank you. So it's not just about, it is about what I'm saying. See us have those conversations. By the way, in North Carolina, in Western North Carolina, where I was two weeks ago or last week, no matter where I've been on the road a lot, but in Asheville, right? what are they doing when they're seeing their neighbors who are in fear because there are so many checkpoints of ice? They are actually taking their kids and taking them to school for them, buying them groceries because they're afraid to go. Talk to your neighbors. Offer help. Those of you who have access to mental health support, offer mental health to your immigrant neighbors, friends, coworkers. We are desperate. If I wake up depressed, no, I'm not depressed because I fight it. But if I wake up with all of those images, oyeme, I'm Maria Hinojosa. That was a joke. <laughs> I know you're like, what does she want? You know, I'm like, you know. But I'm a, I, I recognize, right, I have power. And I'm waking up feeling that way. The flip side of that argument is that for me, learning from our ancestral Native American First Peoples and our African American peoples, 
we have learned, right? Because the essence of so much of this hatred is hatred towards black bodies specifically, and we have to own that, the history of that in this country, but also the African American community has taught us about joy. And so for Latinos and Latinas now, the narrative also has to be one of, of, of joy. But in many ways, I see the fathers and daughters undocumented around us, my students who still come to class at 8 o'clock ready to learn, some of them undocumented. And you know what I feel is that they're, my great, they're the greatest Buddhas now. You know how everybody's meditating. By the way, I'm a big meditator. That's part of my self-care. Um, and you know how the whole thing is like, you know, live in the moment, gratitude, you know, huh? who's teaching us how to do that right now? Our immigrant bodies, undocumented immigrant bodies, human beings, mothers, fathers, children who are getting up every day and going to milk those cows here. That's what some of them do here, right? Okay. That's, that's a joke. <laughs> All right, um, <laughs> also flipping the narrative. So, you know, people say we're going to make it. It's just going to be kind of hell. We're not all going to make it, actually. We're not all going to make it. We reported a story on Latino USA, which if you're not a listener, as soon as I'm done, you're going to take out your phone, you're going to go to your podcast app, and you're going to subscribe to Latino USA and In the Thick. Um, we did a story where we were just following one person who was doing an ICE check-in. So he was actually undocumented, but all above board, been in New York City for 35 years, had two grown children who had gone to college, were already, like the guy lives in Brooklyn and was stocking you know, Staples stores. But he was 50 years old, 51, he had a heart condition, and he was diabetic. And he went in for his check-in with ICE, and I said, you gotta go. He was like, wait, what? I've been doing this for 10 years. That, yep, today, you're going. They put him in detention. Um, when he was in detention, he didn't have his medication. They didn't get it for him. Then he was deported to Mexico, ended up in a small town where the only relative that he has lives, where there was no access to health care or his medication. Long story short, he had two strokes, and he's dead. May he rest in peace. Martin Martinez is dead because he was deported. Just one story. So when people say, you know, the worst, can, the, the worst you know, is the deportation, well, actually, the worst is to die. So important that you understand and that our families understand that if that worst thing happens and we end up being deported, right, that we came to this country and we made it. We succeeded in this country, sometimes inhospitable, and we made it. And if we return, Hopefully, those of us, we won't be killed because we have money, because that's going to happen. But then we can return with our head high, that we made it. That we were part of a historical moment in the United States of America that was not of our making, that was built on by creating fear. And a lot of that fear was created by newsrooms that are not diverse newsrooms that are majority, I've worked in them, majority white, male, wealthy. And that is setting the way in which the whole country sees the narrative of change. By the way, I was telling my lunch table, there have been um, some really amazing, because I, I know there are a lot of white men in this room. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. <laughs> And you're going to be like, oh, the next thing she's going to say is some of her best friends are white men. It's true. <laughs> um, but you know, we, can't, we don't all see the world through your eyes, right? And so that's why I created my own nonprofit media company to say, I'm going to tell these stories. Because part of what happened was that those newsrooms that were not diverse were telling the story of demographic change, not one as like, whoa, look at that opportunity like what we just saw with the data here. Like, look at those opportunities for growth, for business, for, you know, eh, for engagement, for civic engagement, for democracy, for voters. Wow, look at this opportunity. 
No, it was more like, whoa. And as you know, we've already seen the, the New York Times reporting that actually showed that it wasn't economic insecurity that motivated these white voters. It was actually a fear of becoming a minority, of losing power. Remember what I said about we will not replace you, though. We want to dance with you. We want to make love with you. We want to make a country with you. We want to advance with you. Sometimes we're going to fight, because that's what happens. But we're all here together. We love this place so much. That's what my husband says, because he's from the Dominican Republic. He sees me, I'm like, oh my god, my country, what's going on? He's just like, it's so exciting. Because he thinks it's like so exciting to watch democracy in action. He's like, you know, it's the United States, it's the courts, it's the Supreme Court. And he's just like, and I'm just like, you know, heartbreaking. He says, it's because you care too much. And I do. That's why I cry. Because I care too much. It's your turn to ask me questions. Thank you. So you've been in Wichita less than 24 hours-ish? Yep. What's your narrative when you leave here about us and Kansas? Oh, God, I got to get back here. That's my narrative. OK, my narrative, I was taking notes. <laughs> One, I'm going to meet the National Cattlemen's Association people. <laughs> I think there's some women. But I'm going to meet them. Um, I'm going to talk to the Farm Bureau people. Um, I'm going to take back that number of 287% increase in Latinos from the state of Kansas. Um, I am going to, I'm going to do everything that I can to come back. So one of the things that's beautiful of my work is that when I'm able to get out and I'm able to do the work of putting my ground in, in these places, then I meet people and then there's a way in which I'm able to come back and do the journalism, which is what I really want to do. So I, what I really want to do is I want to report about what you are doing in the state of Kansas. Um, and the power that you have, and the local stories. So that's my, my narrative, is that I love this part of the country. And by the way, I, I love the underdog, because I was always, you know, I'm the smallest, you know, I'm wearing six inch heels. So I've always been the tiniest person. I am the underdog, but now I box. <laughs> so I'm not, I never want to get into a fight with anybody, though, I swear. But I love, I, I, I worry about the fact that places like Kansas get the short shrift. Right? It's like, ah, they're all just, you know, oh, Kansas. And I'm like, no. So for me, it's about coming back and trying to report here and doing those stories, whether it's for Latino USA or In the Thick or, um, or for America by the Numbers. So please be in touch with me. Um, this is an opportunity now for you to take out your phones. Now, some of you are going to be like, oh, no, she wants me to subscribe for a podcast. I don't know how to do that. If you don't know how to subscribe to a podcast, help somebody. Turn to your neighbor. If you need help, say, can you help me find the podcast app on my phone? So you can talk amongst yourselves for a second, whisper. And subscribe to Latino USA and In the Thick. Um, the, the numbers for Latino USA, you guys, our audience grew by 45% last year. What media property do you know can say that your audience grew by 45%? It's because of the beauty of the reporting that we do um, and the honesty, but it's also because of the curio curiosity, and it's also because we have a ridiculously diverse staff for Latino USA. You know who's my senior editor of Latino USA? A white guy. <laughs> Name is Marlon Bishop, half Jewish from Queens. So we understand, we understand diversity, right? We live it, and I think that that's what comes out in the journalism that we produce, both Latino USA and in the thick. Um, and so I want to get Kansas and Wichita stories onto my media. And I'm leaving very happy, very, very, very happy. Thank you. Yes, um, I have the microphone. Oh, here, hi. Um, my question is about identity um, in terms of us as a country, as America. Uh, from your personal lens, from the lens of your organization, and, and those you interact with. Um, when we talk about you, when we point at the other person in front, um, I have often wondered who is that you and who is that I or me 
what is America? Who is America today? What do you see? Some days I see the worst of us, um, and then other times I see the total best of us. And I think we're really trying to figure that out. By the way, I don't think this is a new conversation. So we, I think we, we want to believe in American exceptionalism. We want to believe we are so cool. That we're the best democracy. We got it all, but we're not. We're not, you guys. Come on. Japanese American citizens were being put into prison. They were told it was an internment camp. It was imprisonment. And they were told that they were doing that for their own good because you know, there could be an infiltrator among them. So that was happening a stone's throw in our history. You know, women weren't allowed to vote. We could go on and on and on. And then just blacklisting, finding communists. I'm sorry, is Bernie, Bernie Sanders a socialist? Oh, he's a socialist. OK, uh, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, when you become an American citizen, you have to sign off. Are you now, or have you ever been, ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are, I'm like, are you kidding? Like, there was a candidate that run, ran as a socialist, and you're still asking me if I'm a communist? And that's the reason why you're not going to let me become an American citizen? So why I'm saying that is that we ourselves are in a deep process of understanding that. And it is not, an, it is not um, a resolved question. We're evolving. And you're as much of a part of Where are you from originally? Uganda. From Uganda. You, as Ugandan American citizen, are just as much an active frontal part of that conversation as I, a Mexican girl born in Mexico City and raised in Chicago. That we understand that it is a process. And yeah, it's scary. It really is scary. It really is scary. But it is, it is, th that's why this is so important. That's why, to me, it's so important to be here. Because this is what the making of America looks like. This is exactly what it looks like. It looks like us having these conversations, maybe feeling a little uncomfortable, maybe not, like, maybe, mm. that's what it looks like. Because. Hashtag, no nos vamos. Hashtag, we aren't going anywhere. And what I mean is that we aren't going anywhere, all of us. So we got to figure this out. Although I do have a place in Punta Cana that I'm going to be moving to as the American <laughs> refugee location. I mean, seriously, um, that, that was actually the best thing my husband said was like, you got to have a place too. So I'll be opening the American Refugee Center in Punta Cana. <clears throat> yes. Maria, thank you so much for being here. So my background is I was a journalist for 15 years in television broadcasting, worked in Phoenix, learned Spanish. I agree with you. Everybody should know Spanish. Um, but now I am fortunate. I work here at the Kansas Leadership Center, but I'm also the mayor of a small town south of Wichita. Cool. I want your business card. <laughs> well, thanks. Cool. But, journalist but, turned mayor. Okay. Well, and, and so I, I find it interesting because as a journalist, I felt it was very easy to sit on the sidelines and say, gosh, this is bad, this is awful, you know. But then now that I'm in the thick of it, I, I look at people who have all kinds of excuses for not getting involved in politics. But I, I take the blame that part of the reason we're in the situation we are is because I let it happen. And so uh, my, my question to you is, how do we get more qualified, good people to, to step out of their comfort zone and, and run for office and put themselves out there because unless we do, I mean, we've got races right now that I don't even have a choice. I have to pick for the one guy that just happened to put his name on the ballot. And I think that's really what, and, and I would say a lot of our elections are won, not because the candidate was just that much of a good person or a better person. It's just because they were the lesser of two evils or the only one on the ballot. So my question is, how do we get people from being on the sidelines and getting in the game? Because it's risky. What's your name? Shelley Hansel. My question to you, Shelley Hansen, is how do we get other people to do it? Because guess what? You did it. So I think it's really interesting that you're asking me to tell the story of how you did it. You got out of your comfort zone. Well, I don't know about being done, girl. 
A lot of work to be done. So don't be, you know, this retirement thing, eh. You actually have to be the one who is going out there and saying, no, you can. No, you must. No, you really should. No, you got to. No, you please. No, do it. You are the one who has to do it because you already did it. You know, I'm a journalist who then opened my own nonprofit and now do, right? And some journalists, as you know, they look at me and they're like, how did you do it? I'm like, I just figured it out, right? And I'm, I'll help you. That's what we need because people are not sure how to do it. And by the way, both parties have issues. The Republican and the Democrat, Democratic Party have issues around new candidates. And, and, but in fact, I, I'm, I'm jonesing for the old Republican Party. I love Republicans. You know, I mean, I do. So we need them back and engaged in reality. Like we need Democrats back and engaged in reality. They got some problems. They got, they got real problems, you know? Uh, you know, people don't like it when I say it, and it's not like I'm just, you know, but if there is somebody who I believe at this moment has a responsibility to go and visit those children, it is actually Barack and Michelle. And people say, don't, don't, and I'm like, and actually George and Laura, come to think of it, thank you. Now I'm gonna say the four of them, they all should go. The four of them should go. Maybe they'll let them in because as you know, they're run by private prisons. So they don't have to let anybody in. By the way, another little piece of data, the Border Patrol is the largest federal law enforcement agency in the United States today. The Border Patrol is the largest federal law enforcement agency today. Immigration detention in these camps that are horrible is the thing that is getting all of the profits into the private prison industry. So we need to talk about that. But you're the woman who needs to be telling us how to do it. So write that article. Yes. OK, so like Shelly from Welly said, you, everybody should know Spanish. I don't know Spanish, but I do want you to tell me how to say, we drive our household, so I can go home and say oh. that. <laughs> but, <laughs> Nosotras manejamos la casa. Nosotras manejamos la casa. I'll get that before I get home. Yes. And so here's my main question. You mentioned that you don't use the word minority on your show, which I will start to watch, by the way. Listen, uh, it's radio. To listen to the podcast. Got it, download. Thank you, thank you. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on why that you don't use the word minority? Well, seriously, I, I really did. I did, as I was thinking about it, I was like, wow, I've never actually referred to my kids. Like I actually, so this was 10 years ago, you know, more than 10 years. It's like I've never said, you're a member of a minority group, okay, mijito? No, they've always understood that they're Latino, but I never said it in those terms. And so when I, I was like, I don't want to say that to them because I think that's disempowering. I understood it as myself. I understood it. You know, I mean, I was the first Latina hired at NPR and at CNN. I really was like one out of, you know. It, but I, I also am very concerned about how we are dealing with the demographic change. And as somebody who identifies with the other, no matter who that other is, I'm thinking about the future. And I'm thinking about the discomfort of white America in being talked about as a future minority group. And so I'm trying to change that conversation. And I think getting rid of the term is one way in which we can talk about, so how do we do this? right? How do we, how do we make this work so that we're understanding that we're all here, but there isn't going to be a majority? And you're not going to be that majority. And what if we? Don't even think about those terms. How can we move forward? That's why I'm doing it. Thank you. Yes. Hola, Maria. Where are you? There you are. Yes. I'm glad for the way you continue your journaling, even if you're just riding in public transportation or cab, and you ask your questions. And you, I was intrigued by the conversation you had with the one white guy who was kept saying, you got me, you got me. And then you said you understood his fear. I'm trying to figure out how do you understand his fear as, my, as a Latino woman, but also if you understand the fear, how can we embrace, dispel, or educate from that? Um, so I, I actually want to tell you a, another quick story that um, 
soon after Donald Trump had announced, I guess it was maybe, it was in the fall, um, I was in um, Atlanta and I got picked up in a car by an African American man, 50 something. Um, he was driving me to Athens and I asked him, sir, so who are you liking? It's like Donald Trump. I was like, okay. He did not know I was a journalist at that point because I have to be very careful um, and I understand that. Um, and I had a moment with him though. I had a moment where I said, sir, you know, I said, uh, it kind of breaks my heart. I said, and I want you to hear my heart because the first person who made me feel like I could be an American when I was holding a green card and I was just a little Mexican immigrant girl on the south side of Chicago was a black man who looked just like you. His name was Martin Luther King. And so to see you now supporting a man who is saying this about me, I said, it, my heart is breaking. And I think for him it was kind of like, whoa, he took a pause. You know, he kind of, uh, it was at the beginning. So he was like, I'm not, had he really said all those things? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I understood his fear precisely. Uh, and I actually think he listened very closely to what I said. But the gentleman from Omaha, or, or, or people who, um, you know, or the guy who's on the plane with me, I, I understand that they look around and they're just like, when's it gonna end? Like, wh like it feels like the country's being taken over. You know, we had a black man running it and, and we heard that all of these bad things were coming, were, were happening and, and it didn't look so good for my community after all. A lot of people lost their jobs. And, you know, and what are all these people? And I keep telling, you know, I keep watching Fox and they're telling me that they're coming here and they're taking my stuff and they're now they're gang members and they're raping people. And, and I just wanted to, if I was watching Fox 24 seven, I'd be, I don't know, I, actually my speech, part of which I didn't say here, was that I don't know how you can live healthy in that much fear, talking about health, core health. I don't know how you can live healthy when you're fearing that much. So part of that's why I want to talk about the fear and less so much about let me tell you why you shouldn't fear, but rather see it why you shouldn't fear. By the way, you know, it's not like I'm painting, you know, I want it to be clear that it's not like I'm saying open the jails and everybody's beautiful. And no, you know, I mean, I get it. It's complicated, you know. And by the way, there's a lot of fear in immigrant communities from about criminals in their communities because the last thing they're going to do is call the police. But this is a kind of fear that is stoked by, by the media. And in that sense, again, all of us have a role to play. Because all of you have a role to play in that conversation. When you're with your family member, your uncle, your brother. I mean, I remember I said to somebody, where was I? I can't remember what state I was in. But um, I said, he was a, a white man driving a car. And I said, so do you have any, you know, who'd you vote for? He was like, I voted for Hillary. I said, well, do you have any, anybody that you know that might have voted for Trump? He was like, no. Oh, no. No, no, I don't know anybody that voted for Trump. He's driving. He says, hmm, wait, there's my cousin. Oh, my gosh, and my cousin's wife. Oh, boy, there's my uncle. Oh, my God, there's my best friend. So actually, he knew a lot of people who had voted for Trump. right? He didn't want to acknowledge it. And I'm just saying, by the way, it's not so much about Trump. I don't want to give him all the power. I'm saying it's about the conversation. I'm saying it's about the conversation. How can we talk about these things and try to move forward when we understand that we're not going anywhere? I mean, already 2 million people have been deported. 2 million people have been deported already. So shouldn't we be at a point where it's like, OK, yay, celebration. Like, oh, they're not taking our jobs. I mean, like, how many more before you feel like it's going to be OK is what I'm saying. And so don't be afraid to have the conversation. I have a quick question for you. Um, I'm with the Kansas Hispanic Education and Development Foundation, and we work with students, our Latino students here, uh, in uh, education, college preparation, and scholarships and things. But as we see the state, you know, and looking at the statistics uh, that we see, uh, the growth that we're going to have within the Hispanic population, and within a short period of time, we're going to have that 287% growth. In this. But what do you see would be a priority that we need to look at for the state to be prepared for? 
Uh, I, I feel uncomfortable answering that because I'm not from Kansas. Just even. Um, I mean, the first thing I thought of was political engagement. Yeah. That, that's like, so if you ask me, but the first thing that came to mind was political engagement. Right to, um, you know, I, I've done some reporting out of Oregon. Um, you know, Oregon is like rapidly becoming Latino. Again, people are like, Oregon, it's like the whitest state. No. First of all, it was Mexico before. So, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but it is rapidly becoming Latino. So, and, and the first Latino elected to local office in Oregon just happened a couple of weeks ago. So my first reaction is to, to actually do the thing that my fellow journalist here was saying we need to do, which is to run. And by the way, I know it's not easy. I know it's not pretty. You know, that's not my thing. Like, I do journalism. But people have to think about doing politics. Um, so I guess that would be the first thing. And to, um, and to support our communities. Right now, our communities really need a lot of love and support. Like, they really do. Well, I don't know in the work that you all do, but you know, if you have immigrant families around you, um, and you know you're, maybe you're not asking them what their status is, they're hurting. Again, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. You know, and I, I have one family member who has a green card, so I'm worried. Because you know now, the Supreme Court has said, wasn't bold, double space, all caps, and the New York Times or Washington Post, but the, New, but the Supreme Court has upheld that Immigrants, even immigrants with green cards, can be held indefinitely without bond. I know you guys are like, wait, what? Yes. So if you are an immigrant in the civil immigrant detention, you can be held indefinitely without bond. We need to, you need to sit with the fact that due process is being denied on a daily basis to people who's the only difference between them and you, or us and I don't know, not us, because I'm one of them, is that we weren't born in this country. That's the only reason. Who would have thought that the litmus test of you know, how you're treated in this country is whether or not you were born here? That's where we are. But I would just throw it back at you, and I know that you're doing that work, um, to just be the ones that are leading that conversation about what needs to happen. Let's all give Maria a big hand.